Hi, everybody, and welcome to our AIA Fort Lauderdale hosted Revit expert webinar uh, on the five modeling skills in Revit architecture. All right, uh, let's go ahead and jump over to the next slide, please. Okay, so just some housekeeping items here for everybody. Um, all of our attendee lines will be muted for this, uh, for this webinar. Uh, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please do go ahead and send that over to us in the chat box, uh, and we will answer them at the very end. Don't worry, we haven't forgotten about you. Just send those questions over, and we will answer as many as we have time to answer at the very end of the presentation. Uh, additionally, for those of you who are uh, seeking continuing education credits, please do send your AIA number and your name in the uh, chat box as well, and we will record those. And lastly, we will actually be recording this webinar, and uh, you'll be receiving an email with a link to that recording uh, after the webinar today, a couple hours uh, after the webinar. Uh, last but not least here, if you have any questions or concerns, please do give us a call here at Digital Drafting at 305. 445-6480 or email us at info at ddscad.com. Okay, Roger, next slide, please. So I want to go ahead and introduce uh, Roger Mujica, who's going to be our presenter for today. Uh, Roger has uh, a vast knowledge in, in many different uh, areas here in, in design specifically, uh, such as Revit, uh, 3ds Max, AutoCAD, uh, interior design, concept design with Inventor, and uh, Navisworks as well as, as many others. So we are very excited to have Roger with us here today. And uh, yeah, without further ado, Roger, go ahead and take it away. Okay, thank you very much, Alan. And thank you very much for uh, inviting me again to this uh, Revy Expert webinar. I'm kind of super happy about this particular webinar. I started with a lot of energy to the uh, start of the year in January with this uh, very interesting webinar about uh, skills, how we can develop really good uh, skills in Revit, architectural modeling in Revit. As you notice here, we have some really interesting topics to discuss. Uh, many of them, you can tell, I'm gonna be able to provide some demos in Revit so that you can follow along and make some notes about it. And, um, Hopefully, you're going to get something really nice from this webinar. So uh, among the topics that we're going to talk, is one topic that is always kind of a hot topic to discuss in between people that are speaking or made the transition from other applications like AutoCAD to Revy, or actually they start to work with Revy, but still has some interesting things that happen. And this is the first one, transitioning from 2D environment mindset to a 3D mindset. So usually that's like a, our little friends here start to make questions about, I'm giving, sometimes I might say, I might use in gray for about a couple of years, but still I feel that I, there's no quite there. What's gonna happen uh, to make the really fully transition? What happened to me that I still do not get well how to work with Revit. And many of these things has to do with the shifting the transitioning from uh, you know, 2D uh, environment to 3D, or better to think better in 3D instead of 2D. So many professionals still feel comfortable working in the old fashioned way. And when I say that, it's just the, uh, the fact that many people work in 2D environment mentally even without even realizing. So what's the point here? How can I change this mentality or this process thinking from uh, 2D to 3D? Well, one of the first thing is to stop. And I'm gonna suggest to you everybody, because it happens to me too. Stop looking at ways to do things the way that you used to. And that is the key factor here. Many people want to keep using a 3D environment like a 2D environment and not fully adapting the new way of thinking or the new way of work. And that's the key. The key is to stop looking for ways in Revy, how I used to do it in AutoCAD, for example, and then I'm gonna try to look for a way to do it in Revit as well. That's the key factor here. Stop doing that and embrace more your 3D thinking, and that will take you from here 
to the lines and to the uh, sketches sometimes to actually here start to develop your 3D muscle, so to speak, in Revy that actually will get you there in the point that you're going to be able to be doing much more, taking more advantage of the Revy modeling and actually of your project. So that is the key here. And I put this as a, a technique or a skill that we need to develop because that's actually the best first initial part, how we can make the transition from a 2D mindset to a 3D mindset help us a lot tremendously when we work in Revy and along the way with any other application in 3D. As a second point that I would like to mention to you is and a very good skill enhanced to really modeling well in Revy is to having the majority of the levels that we want to use or that we need to use in any particular project set up prior to the modeling. Many people start to modeling in floor plan and that's actually tied up with the first uh, skill that I mentioned earlier, you know, changing or shifting your mindset from 2D to 3D. The point here is that many people start to still mentally to work in floor plans and we not necessarily need to do that in Revit. We need to establish first our majority of levels and you notice here in, in this uh, chart here that having those levels well designed, well thought about it will give us much much more uh, uh, mindset better to 3D and organize better our skill set. So how is that possible? Well, before actually I'm going to show you some of this uh, approach, let's keep in mind some recommendations in creating levels. Uh, and then you're going to see that pretty soon in, in Revit. So when we use uh, levels, we need to keep it in mind in first place that the levels define stories or floor plans or like I, I always say on my trainings levels establish you know a floor plans highs on the horizon so the first floor plan is always uh, before the second floor plan but there are a, a horizon level that establish those Dayton's highs that's the, the thing that you can actually start to define yourself mentally when you use levels. Pay attention to your create plan building level checkbox because uh, many people don't pay attention to that and for every single level that they create that sometimes they want to kind of have a bookmark level and not necessarily a floor plan, uh, then the checkbox will create a level. So I'm going to show you that pretty soon so that you keep that in mind. And Lastly, but not least, when you actually delete a floor plan or you want to delete a floor plan that was created by a level, you can do that, as I mentioned, as I showed you here, you know, view, new, and floor plan, either to create or I'm going to show you in the um, project browser how you can delete some levels because not all the levels require, for example, RCP uh, plans views. So I'm going to jump up quickly to uh, Revy, and I'm going to start a brand new project template. I'm going to use the default, which is, is the template that is the most uh, simple template that we have here. And you're going to notice that every time that we launch a brand new template, 90% of the time they're launching a floor plan. Now, this floor plan represents a level. If I go to any of the elevations here, example the south elevation I can tell very clear that I have two levels level one and level two but before I actually start to think about creating levels or creating specific levels I would like to challenge you to see this for example this is sketch house that I have here so when we are uh, presented with a project like this we start to see that we do have two floor plans only but we start to see that the house in, in a view and in a section start to represent mentally or virtually those levels that I'm talking about. For example, you can tell here that the house is right here on the on the grass or on the 
probably the street level, but the house really doesn't start to be, or the first floor plan is not in that level. It's actually not its own steps up. And then this is really representing my first floor, whereas probably this level here represent my street level. And if I can tell, maybe I make a decision whether this little windows here represents a ventilation underneath this foundation or actually there might be a on the ground basement. So I need to make sure that I understand my intent design. Also, notice here I have the second level here, very clear, the second floor. And the last pine part here should be another level, which is actually the roof level. So if I look at this house, and I follow this exact, uh, you know, design intent that is only, you know, a floor, uh, first floor plan and a second floor plan, no basement, then I can define the levels. I can define one level going here as at the street level, this level, the second floor and the roof. If I look another a scenario, I'm going to just maybe better to jump here. So if I define this as my street level, then I need to make sure when I create a level that I'm gonna have the second floor in the, you know, in the proper height. So if I go here and create levels, you know that levels are created only in sections elevations or uh, sections or elevations. So here I have levels and once I do that, that suggestion that I give you, make sure that your checkbox here is to create plan views. So actually I can define these plan views by clicking here. So how many plans I want to do. Definitely I do not want to do uh, structural plans or only floor plans. So actually I uncheck the structural plan and I keep my floor plan level here. And I'm gonna decide that instead of using this as my street, level, the streets is always a little bit down. So I'm not going to create any floor plan whatsoever, but I don't do that here, but actually I'm checking here. So my first level is going to be probably two or three feet, three and a half feet from the um, first floor down to represent my street level, three and a half feet below. And you notice that the level didn't create any floor plan here. The next floor plan that I'm going to create, definitely I want to create a plan view. And in this case, I'm going to create only floor plan and ceiling plan. That will represent for me, most likely my roof plan. I'm going to make it a 12 feet and go here. And then I have those three levels organized. Um, you can tell when the level, any level do not have any floor plan associated because the identification here of the level mark is in black. Always that will represent that. And when it's in blue, at least one floor plan is connected to that one. You can tell here now that I have the first floor, I have a ceiling plan. In the level two, I have a ceiling plan. And the level floor, I really do not need a ceiling plan. This is actually the roof level that I do need a floor plan to design my roof, but I don't need to have ceiling plan. And here's when I was mentioned to you. You can come here, delete that floor plan, and organize well your uh, project browser with the proper levels. The next thing, so obviously, is the logic thing is to name your levels properly and your plans views properly so that each level represents what it is. So if you actually go here and you represent the, uh, you name it this guy, so probably the, the, the level three here, I will go better here. I can name it, you know, my basement. I usually do this, as this is another top uh, tip, so basement, and that will represent now, when I change that, to the right level. And then here, it's gonna be my first floor, so I'm gonna name this zero one, underscore first floor and just for the sake of this I'm going to change the name I'm going to call it FF here and here the second floor and you're going to see that then you have your levels organized very nicely and lastly the roof so you can do it here as well so all 
three. So once you have this organized, and this is a key factor here, now you organize here to start to create your um, design. So that is a very good tip. Many people don't pay attention to that. They just launch immediately the, the template and start to work as a floor plan. And that is a 2D mindset. So this tip in set up your levels will help you tremendously uh, to work with that. The next thing that I would like to show you as a, a tip is working with the location lines in the walls. So location lines in the walls are another you know topic that many people consider that is not on importance but it's actually very important to keep it in mind when we start to work any design the location line determines the direction of the walls how they will grow and how actually they can be editing or change it later on along the way and if we start with the right food then we're going to have much more workflow better workflow when we design, many people really don't pay attention to that, or they actually stick with the by default center line of the walls. And the center line of the wall, not necessarily all the time, is right on the center of the wall. So the think about the location line as an anchor. This location line will make possible for you to flip the wall and to actually make changes later on in the different layers of the wall and that is a key important thing so when we do that we guarantee that our workflow and our even location of the physical distance between face of the wall with another face of the wall is maintaining so give you a good example i'm going to just explain to you uh, more or less what that means the location line so many people they know, they are aware that it exists, but they don't actually use it for their advantage. When I'm gonna create a wall, whether it's an architectural or structural wall, especially architectural wall, the first thing that I always uh, call our attention is to this uh, area here. See, we know that we have all of the different draw sections here, how we wanna create any wall. <clears throat> but the actually, options bar, which is the real, the proper name of this, is the one that we pay attention. First of all, uh, in architectural design, we're going the walls always from the bottom up, so we're going to the high, that's perfect. But here, we determine to which level we go, and this is actually very, again, tied up with the prior topic or point that we set up our levels properly. We want to spend time to set up the levels properly so that when we have this drop down menu here in order to start to work our walls our levels will be actually very easy to identify to the level that i want the wall to go obviously in this case i'm going to the first floor i'm going to the second floor and immediately grade out this distance because it's based on the distance between the first floor and the second floor but you notice here that is at 10 feet high. Now the location line by default in Revy always this compressor is going to have it by the wall center. What I'm going to do, I'm going to do a specific uh, with this wall, generic A, I'm going to create a line. And if you look at this very carefully, you know that the line is right on the center. Right click cancel. And I'm going to switch to another wall type. I'm going to go to here and I'm going to use now this particular studio wall a uh, brick on cmu on metal stop and i'm going to keep the line wall center did you notice here the center is right on the center of the wall what happened if i then change this to the core center i'm going to keep the same wall you notice that the line is not right on the center of the wall it's on the core center of the actually structural core center of the wall, whichever walls you select. So if I go to, for example, uh, any one of these wall, interior partition, two hours, you notice here the core center obviously is the center. But what happens if I want to create a wall, the exterior wall, 
that I want to keep the exterior line or stereo uh, line of the wall on the exterior face. You notice now that the line is on the exterior. What that means is I'm going to do now the other one to the interior face on the same wall type, and you notice the lines there. When you do that, I'm going to cancel, you select this line. You can tell, I'm going to select them all. You can tell, uh, no, it has to be one by one, that these dots represent your location line. But it's exterior, here it is in the core of the structural, here it is on the center of the wall, independently of how many layers of information have, and this guy is on the center again. If I select any wall type, for example, this one, and I go to the edit type, you will see this a little bit interesting in the preview. You're going to see here in the preview, probably you move that to uh, section, and you're going to see that the core here of the wall is this the layer of info is here so what that means is that when in this case on this wall here that i use the core is right here in the center in this case it's actually right here on the center of the wall itself any wall that you can take now if i use the space bar and many of you have using that to flip the wall I'm using right now the space bar. You notice how the uh, wall remains static on the same distance here. If I actually want to make this a six feet, even if I use the space bar, notice the wall flip it without actually altering the distance. If I select this guy and I'm going to point out to this and I'm going to make it 12 feet even. But now if I use the space bar to flip it, you're gonna notice the distance there change completely. It's not remaining the same 12 feet. And the reason why is because if you notice here, this pointing here of these uh, temporary dimensions pointing to the wall location line or the location line of this wall, which happens to be the core of the structure of that wall. You can flip it too with these little flippers as well. And just using the uh, shortcut menus uh, of the space bar to do it. But again, if I go wall by wall, for example, I want to make this a six feet even. Now notice what happened. This location line is in the exterior face. Now if I flip it, notice how dramatically this actually affect the way that you actually work with the walls. And it will affect anything inside the, the project if you actually are making these changes in a real project. Same situation happened here. If I make this seven feet even, uh, and now this is exterior, notice what happened if I flip it here. It add this foot one inch seven eighth because it's actually the line here. No wonder anytime that you select a wall, you're gonna see the location line is kind is the first information parameter that exists when we work with walls. Now you might say, okay, that looks okay. Let me now open an existing project, two pro two existing projects as a matter of fact, and I'm gonna show you that in a project how it works. So for example, in this floor plan, you notice I select this wall, the uh, location line is in the wall center. So if I flip it, it will not affect any distance here internally. I'm gonna just do it a quick align to here uh, dimension so that you can see that happen. So if I flip it again, it will not affect my interior dimension. And obviously, all of the information that this room is storage and gathering together based on this uh, limited here, the face to face, it will remain the same. What happens if I change the location line? 
that many people ask that question. So what happened uh, if I made the, the wall in the wrong location line? You can always come select the walls and change it here. You don't need to delete the wall and create another one. You can do this by switching this guy here. Now notice what happened if I go to the finish exterior wall location line. Now if I change it, you notice here that this guy added a specific a space here. And many people sometimes don't realize those until they actually kind of a little bit late when they actually have the full set of drawing printed and they realize, hey, what happened here? Supposed to be 12 feet, six inches, and they are now 13. So we tend to work very fast. And then sometimes when you make those changes, you uh, don't realize that until it's a little bit late. So notice here the difference. So uh, working on the right location lines in the wall from the, from the gecko will guarantee to you your a good workflow. That is a good technique. Uh, same situation will happen if I go to any one uh, project. You see, you go to the location line here in the project, I'm gonna turn off this. So even with a, a curtain walls, but I'm gonna go to any specific here, like this one, for example, you're going to notice that the location line is on the exterior, uh, I'm sorry, to the finish exterior face, and any other wall that you want to work with, wall center, it will actually match perfectly with the other ones. Usually that's the best way to work, you know, that you define those. You might get to a point that you want to define exterior walls with a specific location, uh, line for the walls and the interiors keep it in another location line on the walls. The only section of the road in walls and are the actually the curtain walls. Curtain walls and I'm going to go back again to um, uh, my blend uh, info here. When you create curtain walls, curtain walls do not have any one of these or any one that you created do not have a location line. Or better to say, it does have one, but it's always center. So if you go there, you're gonna notice that the location line is always gonna be on the center of the curtain wall. So if I create the curtain wall, I need to be uh, mindful of where the curtain wall really is gonna be uh, facing the, the panels on the exterior side or the interior side and then you kind of flip it here, but the flip always gonna be on the center uh, here in that case. So that's something that you wanna uh, keep it in mind when you work with uh, curtain walls that they are not defined, but always on the center. So when you work in a project, again, you want to make sure that your uh, the way that you built those uh, walls, location line, will be more or less better for you in the long run in the future because many times you need to do adjustments and those adjustments are a little bit of a, uh, a stressful when the location lines are different in one or the other um, different locations on the walls so that usually happen. So everything tied up together so when we go to um, specific um, location line in the walls, we guarantee that the uh, the walls are going to be always easy to manipulate it later. The fourth uh, topic or tips that I, uh, we're going to discuss here is a very hot one. I mean, when I say hot, it's a hot topic in, in, in Revit all the time. We have the topic of the inserting AutoCAD files. So many people start to uh, debate a lot. And, that is what is happening here with this box here. There are many organizations start to um, discuss, okay, I'm gonna insert it versus linking. I'm gonna use AutoCAD files, and I'm not gonna use AutoCAD file. I'm gonna use images instead of AutoCAD or PDF. So that is another topic that which one uh, you're gonna use. But I, in fact, um, uh, when we're talking about inserting, and I'm gonna be specific in AutoCAD files in this case, because it's the majority of the companies using usually use AutoCAD because AutoCAD has been there for 30 plus years. So many companies use and rely on AutoCAD, but there are other AutoCAD files like DGM format DXF is another AutoCAD 
format as well and even SketchUp or Rhino uh, files or SolidWorks so those are considered already CAD files, CAD files but specifically in AutoCAD many companies still are relying in heavily in AutoCAD flow plans at the beginning of the process of the schematic design and that's okay that's fine and then they move those schematic flow plans into or even sometimes sections to actually work on the levels and they actually incorporate it into Revit to start up the process of the big model so what happened uh, what is the situation that many companies encounter when they do actually insert an AutoCAD file that there's a bug always there's bugs yeah so the problem with dwg files is that uh, one of the this is one of the primary uh, causes i you know increase file size so just keep it in mind if you incorporate it into ready three four five six seven different autocad files and when i say autocad remember and we're talking about AutoCAD, but we're also talking about maybe Rhino, Inventor, SolidWorks, SketchUp, ArchiCAD files, that these files create a lot of data inside Revit. And this increase of file size really reduces performance in Revit. And this, many people start to complain, why is this file so heavy or so difficult to manipulate it? So, I'm going to give you here some recommendations that many people usually uh, don't take in, in consideration when they insert AutoCAD files. When possible, minimize the DWG links or imports in Revit. That is a must. So we should not rely heavily on AutoCAD files to start our design process. We actually can do that by just go straight to Revit and do the schematic design in Revit. Now that you know how the location line works, et cetera, and keeping those things in mind and even the levels, then we can actually straightforward start our this schematic design process in Revit directly. Again, but it's not mandatory. So no, it's no, no right or, or wrong answer here, but if, when possible, minimize the DWG files used inside Revit. As a second so, uh, suggestion, recommendations, only link the essential DWG files. So if you necessarily need to use AutoCAD files, your uh, organization, for the sake of uh, speed up the process between schematic and product design, uh, and production design. So they have a team working on AutoCAD and then they pass on to the team of the BIM uh, ready uh, users. So use just the essentials and avoid importing unnecessary data like, for example, hatches, dimension, text. There's a lot of data that AutoCAD file also has. When we actually avoid this and even delete this in a AutoCAD file before prior to import it or link it into Revit, that will actually perform better in Revit and help you to organize better the files. And by all means, the last but not the, the least is to never explode imported AutoCAD files. Probably you have heard this over and over and over again, that never explode an AutoCAD file. That's the tendency many people have. So, oh, I'm going to explode it, so I have it there. Don't do that. So I'm going to show you a couple of things here. First, I'm going to show you an AutoCAD, regular AutoCAD file, and a very decent AutoCAD file floor plan here. So you have a floor plan, I have my text, uh, I have some, a lot of information related, I even have some hatches here representing my you know, uh, floors, et cetera. So if you're gonna import this guy here, or this uh, file into Revit with all of that info, sometimes you wanna find out that you really need, for the sake of the project, to uh, have only you know, walls, doors, and maybe Windows only. Uh, you don't need more. So why the important this AutoCAD file? As a matter of fact, if I go to the layer manager, I do have here also the dimensions. And you notice here when I uh, freeze the dimensions, so how uh, the AutoCAD files start to be a little bit more complicated. So there's two ways 
and I'm gonna suggest you that that's part of the tips that I gave you earlier. So, or you either purge the AutoCAD file, uh, or actually you can turn off or freeze. In my case, I highly recommend to freeze those files that you don't need to, or better to say, those layers that you presumably do not need to use them. So if you freeze them or turn off them, you're always gonna have a lighter version of the AutoCAD. For example, here I can uh, go here, but instead of doing it here, if I don't know the file, usually that's what happens. Sometimes you receive the file from a third party you don't know. You can actually use this little, and I'm giving you some tips in AutoCAD actually as well. So freeze, for example, these notes, these notes, these notes, and notice even these hatches, I don't need this. Even these guys, I don't need this. Probably uh, they are in a different layer. Yes, they are. So, and probably this is a built-in, you know, uh, furniture. And now notice how this AutoCAD file start to be a lot more uh, easy to read by uh, by me. And then obviously when you insert it into Revit, this is one way, and you can actually save this as a you know, second version, actually uh, a version that I can say, you know, a Revit, so that I know that I'm gonna bring this into AutoCAD, uh, into Revit. So when I'm going to insert that into Revit, I'm gonna keep using this same project, I'm gonna delete these guys, and you go to the insert process. So remember you want to insert we have two options to insert AutoCAD files. We can link an AutoCAD file or we can import an AutoCAD file. So again, we can uh, talk about the other ones, but we are specifically talking about uh, AutoCAD. So when I go to AutoCAD, I wanna mention to you again that it's not only DWG files. Notice here we have DSF, DGM, uh, objects, you know, Rhino, etc. But the majority of the time we have AutoCAD files. So if I browse here where my AutoCAD is, and I pick up that one that I already kind of clean up, I will have a light version of that AutoCAD inserted here. I'm gonna preserve the colors, I like to do that. I'm gonna keep all of the layers, uh, and the here I'm gonna put it, you know, center to center. When I hit open and always orient to that view, this AutoCAD only, or like it says here, current view only. So this AutoCAD is only, vis is only visible in this view and that is a good check mark there. When you hit open, this AutoCAD will come here and notice here how easy to read here in Revit, this AutoCAD is a lot friendlier to do. Now, I link this AutoCAD file. What that means is, if you go here to the link manager uh, here, you're gonna see the CAD formats. You're gonna read this guy. So, and you have a safe path, a relative path, etc. It's loaded. You can actually select the AutoCAD and remove it completely from here. And in this same guide, in this same, a managed link, you actually want to in, uh, link again the AutoCAD file. You notice here, I don't have anyone AutoCAD here. And by the way, this uh, link manager, you can find it in the insert tab or, or in the manage tab. So you go here to the manage tab, manage links, you're gonna get it. And I'm gonna bring the other AutoCAD file. So I'm gonna here go to CAD formats, and I'm gonna bring this one with all of those. But in here then, I'm gonna make specific that only bring the, war, the ones that are visible. In this case, I know that the only uh, la layer that I, I don't have there is the uh, dimensions, but I'm gonna bring only the ones that are visible. When I hit open and link it, then now you're gonna see that this AutoCAD looks a lot much more uh, busy here. Now I'm gonna give you a, a kind of part of extra bonus here in this topic of AutoCAD. So if you go to the view where you are and in the visibility graphics, you can in the import categories, turn off those layers that you 
by accident or you just don't want to kind of mess with the AutoCAD file originally. So you can turn off those, for example, here, the hatching, the uh, naming, the notes, the uh, room info, room to you, the shelf, you know, the, all of those, uh, you can start to turn it off and apply, and then you're gonna see how these guys start to now work a little bit here. So another good way to do it, you don't know the, the, the layers, is by going here and query. I wanna select this guy and hiding view. I highly recommend the hiding view still to delete because you're deleting the layer, you might need it later. And then make sure that you click to modify to finish. So there's two ways there so that uh, you do that. Never ever explode the AutoCAD file. Notice here import uh, AutoCAD file is a symbol. And when you not need it anymore, another extra benefit is to either purge it completely from here by going to the manage link and remove it or simple detach it. Usually there's no detach here. You necessarily need to remove it completely and or just keep it there. Now, another benefit, if you, for some reason, do not need to remove it, you need to keep it, but you don't need to see it. Remember in the feasibility graphics, you can completely turn off here in the import categories, the full AutoCAD file, and there are not there. Now, there's no visible, but keep it in mind that this AutoCAD right now is inside this Revy and it will affect your uh, you know, number of the, or the increase of the file size. So that is a, a tip that I, I can give you about this uh, AutoCAD file, imported or linking. And by the way, importing and linking is the same process. Let me back up a little. It's the same process when you go to insert here, you can link and you can import. So if you import an AutoCAD file, you're gonna have the same process. The difference is how that, how it behaves. When you import the AutoCAD is as it is, and from this point on, if the original AutoCAD have any changes, it will not be affected here, or at least it's not gonna be represented here. If you link it, the AutoCAD file, if it's in the same network, will be, now update it every time that somebody, or if, even if you yourself working in the AutoCAD, will update it, it will represent the, the update info here in Revit. That's the difference in between those two. So lastly, uh, as a, a point that I wanna discuss with you is about understanding and applying groups. This is a lot of debate here. So first thing I highlighted, groups are heavier than family. So in architectural design, many people have the tendency to grouping a lot of things, especially layouts, and that actually creates a lot of bad performance in Revit. So if you want to really scale up your, you know, your modeling muscles in Revit for good, keep it in mind that groups are very heavier, uh, are very difficult to control, and there's a lot of things that we need to keep in mind. There's two ways to create groups. One of them is when we use the array command. Maybe many of you have used that before, so that they're actually grouping those together, and then, you know, it's because the uh, checkbox of the copying and associate is always related to it. And the other way to create groups is actually selecting different multiple elements and put it together and group it. So, I'm gonna tell you a little bit before actually I show you something in Revy, uh, some DOMs that we need to keep in mind when we're using groups. Uh, there are more DOMs that actually do. So don't put data and objects in your group. That's a key factor here. Do not ever look at and grouping uh, levels or even views, uh, levels and grids, but particularly those are the two data things in grouping. Don't do that. That will create a lot of managing, you know, uh, issues later on along the way. Don't nest groups. When I'm talking about next group, is that you put a group inside another group. 
and then inside another group. And then that is a nested group. So when you nest group, then you actually are making your work a lot harder because if you select the group, you make any changes, but you need to make a change in the group that is inside the group, then you need to go three, four, five, six steps, depending on how many groups you nested together. Don't group doors and windows without the walls. If you're going to be doing that, you need to, you know, group doors and windows for some, whatever reason that you want to. Don't do the doors and the windows separate as a group. Oh, I'm going to group all of the doors as a one door. You need to have it with the host element because if they, you don't do that, you might run into the problem that the door at the window can be deleted because you're grouping only those elements. And remember, doors and windows necessarily, they depend on the host elements. And don't mirror the groups. And that's another issue. When you mirror the groups, everything shifted. So everything gonna be completely, really a, a nightmare for you. So groups are very good, but at the same time, you need to keep it in mind that groups are very unique. So I'm gonna do this with this actually uh, file here. And you know, you notice that this layout is similar to this one and similar to this one and similar to the other one. So instead of going one by one, I can do that. So definitely I can do groups. So I can do this, select all of these, filter my selection, and I just wanna you know, have only furniture and furniture system probably. And then I have all of this furniture. I have, I think I special equipment here. And I can do this as a group. There's not a problem. You see that multiple categories are selected and I can go here and group, you know, create a group and I'm gonna call, you know, a office layout. And then, you're gonna notice that with this boundary here in the project browser, you're gonna see that the groups here, you're gonna have the model group of office layout. So you're gonna have it there and it's here and the group is there. So now if I try to uh, do this, I'm gonna now try to delete this. It's gonna be a lot easier for me to work on my layouts if I just focus in one specific uh, when I did this a uh, specific uh, layout of one day to the office and then I just import it in the group I just copy the group see if, uh, see if I can select it there it is so I can just copy this group for this point a to point B and then you start to have your layouts this is very good now if I need to make any changes to this later on, then I can still do it. And you know, I can select the group, notice here, edit a group. And I actually I select in the second one, edit a group, and I'm gonna delete this chair. I just simple I'm gonna remove the element from the group. I'm gonna select this. Oh, sorry, yeah, select it. Ah, it's already done and finish. And now you're gonna notice that ooh, something happened. Edit the group, remove this from the group, and finish. I don't know what's happening here. Oh yeah, it's removed, but it's not there. It's uh, now it's not part of the group. That was my mistake. Now I don't notice here, two things are not on the group. Matter of fact, I'm gonna copy this on the side so you can see. Now those guys are removed from the group. So what's the point of the grouping? And how can we actually uh, organize there? So groups are very good because notice here, I can remove those guys. The point is that these guys are still, you know, independent elements. I can now delete them. Uh, and now I have it, but the group without affecting the group, you see? And now I have my group. The group can be selected and edited and it will edit all of them. That's exactly what I did. You notice that these guys now, I can repeat it as many times as possible or I, as I need it and the groups is not going to um, be altered. So if I edit a group and I decided to add something else to that group, obviously I don't have anything here. Or actually if I then 
bring that guy later, that door, that I gonna copy, repair, very similar, I'm gonna put it here, and I can add it later. So those are the benefits of the group, but when you create a group, just keep it in mind that, first of all, groups are, and notice there that now this guy is all the way here. Groups are heavier than family, so that create a lot of strength on the level of your you know, file size. Notice here, if you have a pretty decent project like this one, then you want to consider creating groups and utilize them because they are really complicated here. So lastly, what I would like to mention to you as a bonus tip is that when you modeling architectural designs, but particular architectural design, so that's what we're talking about in a high rise building on any other project, sometimes the tendency is to use the walls going all the way to the top. So um, this building is 20, 24 story building, this wall exterior, I'm gonna make it from the level zero to the roof. Don't do that. Actually, uh, you want to think about, you know, how they build it, how the, the, the actually uh, building is gonna be built. And not necessarily the walls are gonna be there. You don't see those things happen in real life. So it's actually from level to level. So sometimes it's much better to go level to level, work as it is, because you can tell here in this, uh, here that the, you know, the slabs are determining what are the structural elements and how the walls and how all the elements actually is gonna go from level to level. That's another tendency, it's a bonus tip that many people don't keep it in mind. They actually start to do walls, oh, but I wanna save time, many people uh, rely on that. Yes, you're gonna save time right now, but at the long run, it's gonna be a nightmare, especially if you're gonna be working in collaboration with uh, other disciplines like MEP designers or structural engineers designers. And lastly, but not the least, there's so much to learn about Revit. So this is actually the top, you know, the little tip of the iceberg. So we always have something new to learn. We can discuss more in depth what I just showed you, but never stop learning. So there's always a room for improvement and there's so much other tips and tricks that most likely we're gonna incorporate for the rest of the year to you uh, and then uh, share this with you. So hope that you enjoy this. I think it's time now if uh, Alan, you have some questions uh, about the presentation, and it's back to you. All right, perfect. Thank you so much, Roger. Um, okay, so uh, as a quick reminder before we launch into questions here, for those that have not yet, please go ahead and send your AIA number if you're looking for continuing education credit and your name in the questions or chat boxes, and we'll be waiting for those. Uh, okay, so let's take a look here at questions. Additionally, if you have any questions, send those our way and, and we will answer those if we have time. Okay, so does uh, is the Revit uh, ribbon customizable? Good question. Let me actually show. It's actually customizable indeed. So in the same way that we customize here, the ribbon is customizable. You notice here there's a couple of things that I... I can show you here. For example, I can click on here and circulation, click and drag in, and then take this uh, guy away. And I like to put this guy notice here all the way here at the end, or in between these two. And that is actually the way that you can customize uh, the ribbon. Uh, just the only thing that you cannot do is actually delete it. So you cannot delete this. Notice here, the only thing is it's return panels to the ribbon. Now, what's the good thing about this? That, for example, if I need to switch to the ribbon for, for some reason to the annotate here, notice that if I uh, detach momentarily this uh, little panel from there, uh, or tap, better to say, I still can see it here and I can work here if I need to do something here again. But if I then go here and return that to the panel, this tab, if I go back again to the architecture, you're gonna see that it's already returned to here. So yes, you can customize the ribbon. Uh, it has been always in the past a little bit of uh, deal we do that, 
So for example, I like to do this here. So you can uh, you just be gentle in clicking, dra uh, dragging this guy out and put it there and you can customize your way. Uh, my experience, many people don't, don't like to do that, right? We kind of remain a little bit more uh, standard, but yes, it can be customized. Hope that I answered the question. Right, perfect. Um, okay, when a wall does not clean up, is it because of the line location? Yeah, usually that's what happens. So you want to um, to have your line locations always organized since the beginning and then clean up the wall. I mean, when I say since the beginning, when you start to work your walls, you want to make sure that walls are uh, ideally, you know, according to your design intent, you know, to the right location line. All right. Um, okay. When it comes to groups and families, say, for example, you are doing a project that involves uh, typical lodges or lodging units across multiple buildings on the project. Is there a best practice on applying typical unit plans in Revit? similar to the way in which XREF links might be shown down in AutoCAD? That's a good question, though. I have uh, encountered that situation in, in, in many, many times. And what I, I find out that it creates a lot of issues uh, doing that as, a, you know, connecting as an XREF. Because in Revy, we don't have such a thing like a XREF like we do have in AutoCAD, and then the XREF can be, in AutoCAD, the XREF can be actually, when you put in overlay, automatic and you know, you can convert it into finally uh, amend those guys, and then they're gonna be one final file. In Revy, always uh, uh, a link Revy is always gonna be a link Revy. There's two things that happen, might, might happen. It depends how organized the person will organize that. One thing is that, you need to keep it in mind that when you have that in multiple buildings, you need to send all send out all of the buildings, all of the different Revit files. Uh, if you use uh, uh, groups, each one building is going to have their own groups. But yes, remember one of part of the interesting thing about groups that they will increase the height of the the the, the Revit size. But it's, it's, it depends how well organized people they do that. They can do. They can actually link different uh, small groups there. Now, when it comes to different levels, I don't suggest that because when you are in, for example, in levels, bring the level from one building to another building will need that you now work better or, or much much organized levels. If I have this level and the other building for some reason have kind of the same level but a little bit higher, then it's going to be a mishmash there in the information. So you need to be kind of address that in a white paper first and see what will be the best uh, route to take. I hope that that helped a little bit because this is a question that can be expanded in so many, it, it, for situation based basically you know, how they want to use it. All right, perfect. Um, okay, so I think that's probably a good place to stop just with our timing here. So can I have you jump back to that PowerPoint for us, Roger? Sure. All right, perfect. So just to close here, first, thank you all for being here today. We really, really appreciate you taking the time to, uh, to spend with us here and learn a little bit more. Um, Again, uh, we will be, you know, doing some more of these webinars in the future, so definitely keep an eye out for those. We'll we'll be letting y'all know. Um, okay, and just some closing remarks here, please. Uh, if you're uh, needing any additional support uh, for your software needs, services needs, things of that nature, please do reach out to us here at Digital Drafting Systems. Our phone number is 305-445-6480, and our email is info at ddscad.com. Uh, and I think that's it. Uh, thank you so much, Roger. Thanks, everybody. No, thank you for the invitation. So I hope that everybody enjoyed it as, as much as I did. All right. 
Sounds good. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.